a gentle ghost by mary e wilkins from a new england nun and other stories this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org reading by matt perard a gentle ghost by mary e wilkins out in front of the cemetery stood a white horse and a covered wagon the horse was not tied but she stood quite still her four feet widely and ponderously planted her meek white head hanging shadows of leaves danced on her back there were many trees about the cemetery and the foliage was unusually luxuriant for may the four women who had come in the covered wagon remarked it i never saw the trees so forward as they are this year seems to me said one gazing up at some magnificent gold-green branches over her head i was saying so to mary this morning rejoined another they're uncommon forward i think they loitered along the narrow lanes between the lots four homely middle-aged women with decorous and subdued enjoyment in their worn faces they read with peaceful curiosity and interest the inscriptions on the stones they turned aside to look at the tender newly blossomed spring bushes the flowering almonds and the bridal wreaths once in a while they came to a new stone which they immediately surrounded with eager criticism there was a solemn hush when they reached a lot where some relatives of one of the party were buried she put a bunch of flowers on a grave then she stood looking at it with red eyes the others grouped themselves deferentially aloof they did not meet any one in the cemetery until just before they left when they had reached the rear and oldest portion of the yard and were thinking of retracing their steps they became suddenly aware of a child sitting in a lot at their right the lot held seven old leaning stones dark and mossy their inscriptions dimly traceable the child sat close to one as she looked up the staring knot of women with a kind of innocent keenness like a baby her face was small and fair and pinched the women stood eyeing her what's your name little girl asked one she had a bright flower in her bonnet and a smart lift to her chin and seemed the natural spokeswoman of the party her name was holmes the child turned her head sideways and murmured something what we can't hear speak up don't be afraid what's your name the woman nodded the bright flower over her and spoke with sharp pleasantness nancy wren said the child with a timid catch of her breath wren the child nodded she kept her little pink curving mouth parted it's nobody i know remarked the questioner reflectively i guess she comes from over there she made a significant motion of her head towards the right where do you live nancy she asked the child also motioned towards the right i thought so said the woman how old are you ten the women exchanged glances are you sure you're telling the truth the child nodded i never saw a girl so small for her age if she is said one woman to another yes said mrs holmes looking at her critically she is dreadful small she's considerable smaller than my mary was is there any of your folks buried in this lot said she barely hovering with affability and determined graciousness the child's upturned face suddenly kindled she began speaking with a soft volubility that was an odd contrast to her previous hesitation that's mother said she pointing to one of the stones and that's father and there's john and margaret and mary and susan and the baby and here's jane the woman stared at her in amazement was it your began mrs holmes but another woman stepped forward stoutly impetuous land it's the blake lot said she this child can't be any relation to him you hadn't ought to talk so nancy it's so said the child shyly persistent she evidently hardly grasped 
the force of the woman's remark they eyed her with increased bewilderment it can't be said the woman to the others every one of them blakes died years ago i've seen jane volunteered the child with a candid smile in their faces then the stout woman sank down on her knees beside jane stone and peered hard on it she died forty year ago this may said she with a gasp i used to know her when i was a child she was ten years old when she died you ain't ever seen her you hadn't ought to tell such stories i ain't seen her for a long time said the little girl what made you say you'd seen her at all said mrs holmes sharply thinking this was capitulation i did used to see her a long time ago and she used to wear a white dress and a wreath on her head she used to come here and play with me the women looked at each other with pale shocked faces one nervous one shivered she ain't quite right she whispered let's go the women began filing away mrs holmes who came last stood about for a parting word to the child you can't have seen her said she severely and ye are a wicked girl to tell such stories you mustn't do it again remember nancy stood with her hand on jane stone looking at her she did she repeated with mild obstinacy there's something wrong about her i guess whispered mrs holmes rustling on after the others i say she looked kind of queer the minute i set eyes on her said the nervous woman when the four reached the front of the cemetery they sat down to rest for a few minutes it was warm and they had still quite a walk nearly the whole width of the yard to the other front corner where the horse and wagon were they sat down in a row on a bank the stout woman wiped her face mrs holmes straightened her bonnet directly opposite across the street stood two houses so close to each other that their walls almost touched one was a large square building glossily white with green blinds the other was low with a facing of whitewashed stonework reaching to its lower windows which somehow gave it a disgraced and menial air there were moreover no blinds at the side of the low building stretched a wide ploughed field where several halting old figures were moving about planting there was none of the brave hope of the sower about them even across the road one could see the feeble stiffness of their attitudes the half palsied fling of their arms i declare i shouldn't think them old men over there would ever get that field planted said mrs holmes energetically watchful in the front door of the square white house sat a girl with bright hair the yard was full of green light from two tall maple trees and the girl's hair made a brilliant spot of colour in the midst of it that's flora dunn over there on the doorstep ain't it said the stout woman yes i should think you could tell her by her red hair i knew it i should have thought mr dunn would have hated to have had their house so near the poorhouse i declare i should oh he wouldn't mind said mrs holmes he's as easy as old tilly it wouldn't have troubled him any if they'd set it right in his front yard but i guess she minded some i heard she did john said there wa not any need of it the town wouldn't have set it so near if mr dunry had set his foot down he wouldn't have it there i s'pose they wanted to keep that big field on the side clear out they would have moved it along a little if he'd made a fuss i tell you what tis i've about made up my mind i dun know as it's scripture but i can't help it if folks don't make a fuss they won't get their rights in this world if you just lay still and don't rise up you're going to get stepped on if people like to be they can i don't i should have thought he'd have hated to have the poorhouse quite so close murmured the stout woman suddenly mrs holmes leaned forward and poked her head among the other three she sat on the end of the row say said she in a mysterious whisper i want to know if you've heard the stories about the dunn house 
no what chorused the other women eagerly they bent over towards her till the four faces were in a knot well said mrs holmes cautiously with a glance at the bright-headed girl across the way i heard it pretty straight they say the house is haunted the stout woman sniffed and straightened herself haunted repeated she they say that ever since jenny died there's been queer noises round the house that they can't account for you see that front chamber over there the one next to the poorhouse well that's the room they say the women all turned and looked at the chamber windows where some ruffled white curtains were fluttering that's the chamber where jenny used to sleep you know mrs holmes went on and she died there well they said that before jenny died flora had always slept there with her but she felt kind of bad about going back there so she thought she'd take another room well there was the awfulest moanin and takin on up in jenny's room when she did that flora went back there to sleep i shouldn't a thought she could whispered the nervous woman who was quite pale the moanin stopped just as soon as she got in there with the light you see jenny was always terrible timid and afraid to sleep alone and had a lamp burnin all night and it seemed to them just as if it really was her i suppose i don't believe one word of it said the stout woman getting up it makes me all out of patience to hear people talk such stuff just because the duns happen to live opposite a graveyard i told it just as i heard it said mrs holmes stiffly oh i ain't blamin you it's the folks that start such stories that i ain't got any patience with think of that dear pretty little sixteen-year-old girl haunting a house well i've told it just as i heard it repeated mrs holmes still in a tone of slight umbrage i don't ever take much stock in such things myself the four women strolled along to the covered wagon and climbed in i declare said the stout woman conciliatingly i don't know when i've had such an outing i feel as if it had done me good i've been wantin to come down to the cemetery for a long time but it's most more'n i want to walk i feel real obliged to you miss holmes the others climbed in mrs holmes disclaimed all obligations gracefully established herself on the front seat and shook the reins over the white horse then the party jogged along the road to the village past outlying farmhouses and rich green meadows all freckled gold with dandelions dandelions were in their height the buttercups had not yet come flora dunn the girl on the doorstep glanced up when they started down the street then she turned her eyes on her work she was sewing with nervous haste who were these folks did you see flora called her mother out of the sitting-room i didn't notice replied flora absently just then the girl whom the women had met came lingeringly out of the cemetery and crossed the street there's that poor little rain girl remarked the voice in the sitting-room yes assented flora after a while she got up and entered the house her mother looked anxiously at her when she came into the room i'm all out of patience with you flora said she you're just as white as a sheet you'll make yourself sick you're acting dreadful foolish flora sank into a chair and sat staring straight ahead with a strained pitiful gaze i can't help it i can't do any different said she i shouldn't think you'd scold me mother scold you i ain't scolding you child but there ain't any sense in your doing so you'll make yourself sick and you're all i've got left i can't have anything happen to you flora suddenly mrs dunn burst out in a low wail hiding her face in her hands i don't see you're much better yourself mother said flora heavily i don't know as i am sobbed her mother but i've got you to worry about besides everything else oh dear oh dear dear i don't see any need of your worrying about me flora did not cry but her face seemed to darken visibly with a gathering melancholy like a cloud 
her hair was beautiful and she had a charming delicacy of complexion but she was not handsome her features were too sharp her expression too intense and nervous her mother looked like her as to the expression the features were widely different it was as if both had passed through one corroding element which had given them the similarity of scars certainly a stranger would at once have noticed the strong resemblance between mrs dunn's large heavy-featured face and her daughter's thin delicately outlined one a resemblance which three months ago had not been perceptible i see if you don't returned the mother i ain't blind i don't see what you are blaming me for i ain't blaming you but it seems to me that you might just as well let me go up there and sleep as you suddenly the girl also broke out into a wild cry i ain't going to leave her poor little jenny poor little jenny you needn't try to make me mother i won't flora don't i won't i won't i won't poor little jenny oh dear oh dear what if it is so what if it is her ain't she got me as well as you can't her mother go to her i won't leave her i won't i won't suddenly mrs dunn's calmness seemed to come uppermost raised in the scale by the weighty impetus of the other's distress flora said she with mournful solemnity you mustn't do so it's wrong you mustn't wear yourself out over something that maybe you'll find out wasn't so some time or other mother don't you think it is don't you don't you think it is don't you i don't know what to think flora just then a door shut somewhere in the back part of the house there's father said mrs dunn getting up and the fire ain't made flora rose also and went about helping her mother to get supper both suddenly settled into a rigidity of composure their eyes were red but their lips were steady there was a resolute vein in their characters they managed themselves with wrenches and could be hard even with their grief they got tea ready for mr dunn and his two hired men then cleared it away and sat down in the front room with their needlework mr dunn a kindly dull old man was in there too over his newspaper mrs dunn and flora sewed intently never taking their eyes from their work out in the next room stood a tall clock which ticked loudly just before it struck the hours it made always a curious grating noise when it announced in this way the striking of nine mrs dunn and flora exchanged glances the girl was pale and her eyes looked larger she began folding up her work suddenly a low moaning cry sounded through the house seemingly from the room overhead there it is shrieked flora she caught up a lamp and ran mrs dunn was following when her husband sitting near the door caught hold of her dress with a bewildered air he had been dozing what's the matter said he vaguely don't you hear it didn't you hear it father the old man let go of her dress suddenly i didn't hear nothing said he hark but the cry in fact had ceased flora could be heard moving about in the room overhead and that was all in a moment mrs dunn ran upstairs after her the old man sat staring it's all dumb foolishness he muttered under his breath presently he fell to dozing again and his vacantly smiling face locked forward mr dunn slow-brained patient and unimaginative had had his evening naps interrupted after this manner for the last three months and there was as yet no cessation of his bewilderment he dealt with the simple broad lights of life the shadows were beyond his speculation for his consciousness his daughter jenny had died and gone to heaven he was not capable of listening for her ghostly moans in her little chamber overhead much less of hearing them with any credulity when his wife came downstairs finally she looked at him sleeping there with a bitter feeling she felt as if set about by an icy wind of loneliness her daughter 
who was after her own kind was all the one to whom she could look for sympathy and understanding in this subtle perplexity which had come upon her and she would rather have dispensed with that sympathy and heard alone those piteous uncanny cries for she was wild with anxiety about flora the girl had never been very strong she looked at her distressfully when she came down the next morning did you sleep any last night said she some answered flora soon after breakfast they noticed the little wren girl stealing across the road to the cemetery again she goes over there all the time remarked mrs dunn i believe she runs away see her look behind her yes said flora apathetically it was nearly noon when they heard a voice from the next house calling nancy 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 wren the voice was loud and imperious but slow and evenly modulated it indicated well its owner a woman who could regulate her own angry voice could regulate other people mrs dunn and flora heard it understandingly that poor little thing will catch it when she gets home said mrs dunn nancy 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 wren called the voice again i pity the child if mrs gregg has to go after her maybe she's fell asleep over there flora why don't you run over there and get her the voice rang out again flora got her hat and stole across the street a little bit below the house so the calling woman should not see her when she got into the cemetery she called in her turn letting out her thin sweet voice cautiously finally she came directly upon the child she was in the blake lot her little slender body in its dingy cotton dress curled up on the ground close to one of the graves no one but nature tended those old graves now and she seemed to be lapsing them gently back to her own lines at her own will of the garden shrubs which had been planted around them not one was left but an old low spraying white rose bush which had just gotten its new leaves the blight lot was at the very rear of the yard where it verged upon a light wood which was silently stealing its way over its own proper boundaries at the back of the lot stood a thicket of little thin trees with silvery twinkling leaves the ground was quite blue with houstonias the child raised her little fair head and stared at flora as if just awakened from sleep she held her little pink mouth open her innocent blue eyes had a surprised look as if she were suddenly gazing upon a new scene where's she gone asked she in her sweet feeble pipe where's who gone jane i don't know what you mean come nancy you must go home now didn't you see her didn't you see her i didn't see anybody answered flora impatiently come she was right here what do you mean jane was standing right here and she had her white dress on and a wreath flora shivered and looked around her fearfully the fancy of the child was overlapping her own nature there wasn't a soul here you've been dreaming child come no i wasn't i've seen them blue flowers and the leaves waken all the time jane stood right there the child pointed with her tiny finger to a spot at her side she hadn't come for a long time before she added she stayed down there she pointed at the grave nearest her you mustn't talk so said flora with tremulous severity you must get right up and come home mrs gregg has been calling you and calling you she won't like it nancy turned quite pale around her little mouth and sprang to her feet is miss gregg coming she will come if you don't hurry the child said not another word she flew along ahead through the narrow paths and was in the almshouse door before flora crossed the street she's terrible afraid of mrs gregg she told her mother when she got home nancy had disturbed her own brooding a little and she spoke more like herself poor little thing i pity her said mrs dunn mrs dunn did not like mrs gregg flora rarely told a story until she had ruminated a while over it 
herself it was afternoon and the two were in the front room at their sewing before she told her mother about jane of course she must have been dreaming flora said she must have been rejoined her mother but the two looked at each other and their eyes said more than their tongues here was a new marvel new evidence of a kind which they had heretofore scented at these two rigidly walking new england souls yet walking after all upon narrow paths through dark meadows of mysticism if they never lost their footing the steaming damp of the meadows might come in their faces this fancy delusion superstition whichever one might name it of theirs had lasted now three months ever since young jenny dunn had died there was apparently no reason why it should not last much longer if delusion it were the temperaments of these two women naturally nervous and imaginative overwrought now by long care and sorrow would perpetuate it if it were not delusion pray what exorcism what spell of book and bell could lay the ghost of a little timid child who was afraid alone in the dark the days went on and flora still hurried up to her chamber at the stroke of nine if she were a moment late sometimes if she were not that pitiful low wail sounded through the house the strange story spread gradually through the village mrs dunn and flora were silent about it but gossip is herself of a ghostly nature and minds not keys nor bars there was quite an excitement over it people affected with morbid curiosity and sympathy came to the house one afternoon the minister came and offered a prayer mrs dunn and flora received them all with a certain reticence they did not concur in their wishes to remain and hear the mysterious noises for themselves people called them dreadful close they got more satisfaction out of mr dunn who was perfectly ready to impart all the information in his power and his own theories in the matter i never heard a thing but once said he and then it sounded more like a cat to me than anything i guess mother and flora are kind of nervous the spring was waxing late when flora went upstairs one night with the oil low in her lamp she had neglected filling it that day she did not notice it until she was undressed then she thought to herself that she must blow it out she always kept a lamp burning all night as she had in timid little jenny's day flora herself was timid now so she blew the light out she had barely laid her head upon the pillow when the low moaning wail sounded through the room flora sat up in bed and listened her hands clenched the moan gathered strength and volume little broken words and sentences the piteous ejaculations of terror and distress began to shake themselves out of it flora sprang out of bed and stumbled towards her west window the one on the almshouse side she leaned her head out listening a moment then she called her mother with wild vehemence but her mother was already at the door with a lamp when she entered the moans ceased mother shrieked flora it ain't jenny it's somebody over there at the poorhouse put the lamp out in the entry and come back here and listen mrs dunn set out the lamp and came back closing the door it was a few minutes first but presently the cries recommenced i'm going right over there said mrs dunn i'm going to dress myself and go over there i'm going to have this affair sifted now i'm going too said flora it was only half past nine when the two stole into the almshouse yard the light was not out in the room on the ground floor which the overseer's family used for a sitting-room when they entered the overseer was there asleep in his chair his wife sewing at the table and an old woman in a pink cotton dress apparently doing nothing they all started and stared at the intruders good evening said mrs dunn trying to speak composedly we thought we'd come in we got kind of started oh there it is now what is it miss gregg in fact at that moment the wail louder and more distinct was heard why it's nancy replied mrs gregg with dignified surprise 
she was a large woman with a masterly placidity about her i heard her a few minutes ago she went on and i was going up there to see her if she hadn't stopped mr gregg a heavy saturnine old man with a broad bristling face sat staring stupidly the old woman in pink calico surveyed them all with an impersonal grin nancy repeated mrs dunn looking at mrs gregg she had not fancied this woman very much and the two had not fraternized although they were such near neighbours indeed mrs gregg was not of a sociable nature and associated very little with anything but her own duties yes nancy wren she said with gathering amazement she cries out this way most every night she's ten years old but she's as afraid of the dark as a baby she's a queer child i guess maybe she's nervous i don't know but she's got notions into her head staying over in the graveyard so much she runs away over there every chance she can get and she goes over a queer rigmarole about playing with jane and her being dressed in white and a wreath i found out she meant jane blake that's buried in the blake lot i knew there wa'n't any children round here and i thought i'd look into it you know it says our father and our mother on the old folks stones and there she was calling them father and mother you'd thought they was right there i've got most out of patience with the child i don't know nothing about such kind of folks the wail well continued i'll go right up there said mrs gregg determinately taking a lamp mrs dunn and flora followed when they entered the chamber to which she led them they saw little nancy sitting up in bed her face pale and convulsed her blue eyes streaming with tears her little pink mouth quivering nancy began mrs gregg in a weighty tone but mrs dunn sprang forward and threw her arms around the child you got frightened didn't you whispered she and nancy clung to her as if for life a great wave of joyful tenderness rolled up in the heart of the bereaved woman it was not after all the lonely and fearfully wandering little spirit of her dear jenny she was peaceful and blessed beyond all her girlish tumults and terrors but it was this little living girl she saw it all plainly now afterwards it seemed to her that any one but a woman with her nerves strained and her imagination unhealthily keen through watching and sorrow would have seen it before she held nancy tight and soothed her she felt almost as if she held her own jenny i guess i'll take her home with me if you don't care she said to mrs gregg why i don't know as i've got any objections if you want to answered mrs gregg with cold stateliness nancy wren has had everything done for her that i was able to do she added when mrs dunn had wrapped up the child and they were all on the stairs i ain't coaxed and cuddled her because it ain't my way i never did with my own children oh i know you've done all you could said mrs dunn with abstracted apology i just thought i'd like to take her home to-night don't you think i'm blaming you miss gregg she bent down and kissed the little tearful face on her shoulder she was carrying nancy like a baby flora had hold of one of her little dangling hands you shall go right upstairs and sleep with flora mrs dunn whispered in the child's ear when they were going across the yard and you shall have the lamp burning all night and i'll give you a piece of cake before you go it was the custom of the dunns to visit the cemetery and carry flowers to jenny's grave every sunday afternoon next sunday little nancy went with them she followed happily along and did not seem to think of the blake lot that's pitiful fancy if fancy it were which had peopled her empty childish world with ghostly kindred which had led into it an angel playmate in white robe and crown might lie at rest now there was no more need for it she had found her place in a nest of living hearts and she was getting her natural food of human love they had dressed nancy in one of the little white frocks which jenny had worn in her childhood and her hat was trimmed with some ribbon and rosebuds which had adorned one of the dead young girls a year before 
it was a beautiful sunday after they left the cemetery they strolled a little way down the road the road lay between deep green meadows and cottage yards it was not quite time for the roses and the lilacs were turning gray the buttercups in the meadows had blossomed out but the dandelions had lost their yellow crowns and their filmy skulls appeared they stood like ghosts among crowds of golden buttercups but none of the family thought of that their ghosts were laid in peace End of a gentle ghost by mary e wilkins grand dame's ghost story by c d this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by april six zero nine zero california united states of america grand dame's ghost story by c d i don't know whether you ever tell your children ghost stories or not some mothers don't but our mother though of german descent was strong-minded on the ghost subject and early taught all of her children to be fearless mentally as well as physically and though dearly fond of hearing ghost stories especially if they were real true ghost stories we were sadly skeptical as to there being anything of the kind that could harm we were quite learned in ghostly lore knew all about doppelgangers will-o'-wisp blue lights etc and we could not have a greater treat for good behavior than for our mother to draw on her store of supernatural tales for our entertainment the story i am about to relate she told us one stormy night when gathered round her chair in her own cosy sanctum before a cheerful fire we ate nuts and apples and listened while she recited an old true tale told her by her grandmother who herself witnessed the vision it was a fearful night the wind sobbed and wailed round the house like lost spirits mourning their doom the rain beat upon the casements and the trees writhing in the torture of the fierce blast groaned and swayed until their tops almost swept the earth bright flashes of lightning pierced even through the closed shutters and heavy curtains and the thunder had a sullen threatening roar that made your blood creep it was a night to make one seek to shut out all sound draw the curtains close stir the fire and nestle deep in the armchair before it with feet upon the fender and have something cheerful to think or talk about but i was all alone none in the house with me but the servants and the servants wing was detached from the main part of the building for i do not care to have menials near me and i had no loved ones near it was just such a night that nancy black died what a fearful night for the soul to leave its earthly home and go out into the vast unknown future i spoke aloud as rousing from a train of thought i drew my heavy mantle closer round me wheeled my armchair nearer the fire and cuddled down in it burying my feet in the foot cushion to warm them for i felt strangely cold i was in the library it was my usual sitting-room for i seldom used the parlors what was the use my books were my friends i loved best to be with them my children dead or married and away the cold grand parlors always seemed gloomy and sad the ghosts of departed pleasures haunted them and i cared not to enter them it was a long wide room across the hall from the parlors running the whole length of the house and was lined with shelves from floor to ceiling my husband's father had always been a bibliomaniac and my husband had had a leaning that way also and the shelves held many an old rare work that was worth its weight in gold the fire though burning brightly did not illume one half the room of which sitting in the chimney corner i commanded a full view and had been looking at the shadows playing on the furniture and shelves as the flame shot up and after flickering a moment would die out leaving a gloom which would break away into fantastic shadows as the firelight would again shoot up while watching the gleams of light and darkling shades unconsciously the wailing of the storm outside attracted my attention there seemed to be odd noises of tapping on the windows and sobs and sighs 
as though someone was entreating entrance from the fierce tumult and as i sat there again i thought of nancy black the old schoolgirl friend who had loved me so dearly and the night when she went forth to meet the doom appointed her resting my head upon my hand i sat gazing in the fire thinking over her strange life and still stranger death and wondering what could have become of the money and jewels that i knew she had once possessed while sitting thus a queer sensation crept over me it was not fear but a feeling as though if i looked up i'd see something frightful a shiver not like that of cold ran from my head to my feet and a sensation as though someone was breathing icy cold breath upon my forehead the same feeling you would cause by holding a piece of ice to your cheek it fluttered over my face and finally settled round my lips as though the unseen one was caressing me thrilling me with horror but i am not fearful nervous nor imaginative and resolutely throwing off the dread that fell upon me i turned round and looked up and there so close by my side that my hand involuntarily thrown out passed through her seeming form stood nancy black it was nancy black and yet not nancy black her whole body had a semi-transparent appearance just as your hand looks when you hold it between yourself and a strong light her clothing apparently the same as worn in life had a wavy seething flickering look like flames have and yet did not seem to burn in the name of god nancy black what brought you here and whence came you i exclaimed a hollow whisper followed thank you my old friend for speaking to me and oh how deeply i thank you for thinking of me to-night i shall have rest rest i heard echoed and a jeering laugh rang through the room that made her quiver at its sound i have been near you often but always failed to find you in a condition when you would be en rapport before to-night what i came for i will tell you whence i come you need not know suffice it to say that were i happy i would not be here on such an errand nor on such a night it is only when the elements are in a tumult and the winds wail and moan that we come forth when you hear these sounds it is souls of the lost you hear mourning their doom tis then they wander up and down to and fro their only release from their fearful home of torture and undying pain i have come to tell you that you must go over to the old house and in the back room i always kept locked have the carpet taken up from toward the fireplace you will see a plank with a knot hole in it remove that and you will find what caused me to lose my soul have prayers said for me for tis well to pray for the dead the money and jewels give in charity bury in holy ground the others you find and pray for them and me ah jeanette you thought your old friend though strange and odd pure and innocent it is a bitter part of my punishment that i must change your thought of me farewell do not fail me and i shall trouble you no more but whenever you hear that wind howl and sweep round the house as it does to-night know that the lost are near it is their swift flight through space fleeing before the scourge of memory and conscience that causes that sound that to-morrow you may not think you are dreaming here is a token and she touched the palm of my hand with her fingertips and as you see my child to this day there are three crimson spots in the palm of my hand that nothing will eradicate do not fail me and pray for us jeanette pray and with a longing wistful gaze and a deep sobbing sigh nancy black faded from my sight am i dreaming i exclaimed as i rose from my chair and rang the bell when the servant entered i bade him attend to the fire and light the lamps and i went through the room to see if any unusual arrangement of the furniture could have caused the appearance but nothing was apparent and i bade him send my maid to attend me in my chamber for i could not help feeling unwilling to remain in the library any longer that evening while making my toilet for the night my maid said have you burned your hand madame glancing hastily down i saw three dark crimson spots upon the palm of my left hand they had an odd look seared as though touched by a red-hot iron yet the flesh was soft not burned and not painful making some excuse for it i did not allude to it again 
and dismissed her speedily that i might reflect undisturbed over the singular occurrence there were the marks upon my hand i could not remove them and they did not fade in fact their deep red made the rest of the palm lose its pinkish hue and look pale from the strong contrast could i have been asleep and dreamed it all and by any means have done this to myself i thought but finally concluded that on the morrow i'd go over to nancy black's old residence and settle the question and with that conclusion had to content myself until the morrow came nancy black was an old friend from my girlhood who had owned large property in the town and lived all alone in a spacious stone house directly opposite my home and who when dying had left me the sole legatee of her property when morning came i took the keys and with my maid went over to nancy's house it had never been disturbed since her death which was sudden and somewhat singular and the furniture remained just as she left it when taken to her last resting place we went to the room nancy had directed i bade sarah take up the carpet and sure enough there was a plank with a knot-hole in it so i sent her from the room and lifted the plank myself and there between the two joints rested a long box the lid not fastened opening it i was horrified to see two skeletons those of an infant and of a woman small in stature and delicate frame in a moment it flashed before me that i saw all that remained of nancy black's younger sister a girl of seventeen who had left home somewhat mysteriously years ago and had died while absent at least that was the version nancy had given of her absence and no one had dreamed of doubting it her tale was so naturally told left orphans when lucy was only two years and nancy eighteen she had devoted her life to the care of this young girl and when she found her sister had fallen she in her pride of name and position had destroyed mother and child that her shame might not be known and had lived all those dreary years in that house with her fearful secret round the box heaped up on every side were money and jewels and a parchment scroll among them had written on it lucy's share of our father's estate i carried out nancy's wishes to the letter for i now firmly believed that she had come to me herself that night to avoid scandal resting on the dead i took our clergyman into my confidence and with his assistance had the remains buried quietly in consecrated ground the money and jewels were given to the poor and the old building i turned into a home for destitute females and morning and night as i kneel in prayer i pray forgiveness to rest upon nancy black and peace to her troubled soul end of grand dame's ghost story the corpse on the grating by hugh b cave this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the corpse on the grating by hugh b cave it was ten o'clock on the morning of december fifth when m s and i left the study of professor daimler you are perhaps acquainted with m s his name appears constantly in the pages of the illustrated news in conjunction with some very technical article on psychoanalysis or with some extensive study of the human brain and its functions he is a psychofanatic more or less and has spent an entire lifetime of some seventy-odd years in pulling apart human skulls for the purpose of investigation. Lovely pursuit. For some twenty years I have mocked him, in a friendly, half-hearted fashion. I am a medical man, and my own profession is one that does not sympathize with radicals. As for Professor Daimler, the third member of our little triangle, perhaps if I take a moment to outline the events of that evening, the professor's part in what follows will be less obscure we had called on him m s and i at his urgent request his rooms were in a narrow unlighted street just off the square and daimler himself opened the door to us a tall loosely built chap he was standing in the doorway like a motionless ape arms half extended i've summoned you gentlemen he said quietly because you two of all london are the only persons who know the nature of my recent experiments. I should like to acquaint you with the results. He led the way to his study, then kicked the door shut with his foot, seizing my arm as he did so. Quietly, 
he dragged me to the table that stood against the farther wall. In the same even, unemotional tone of a man completely sure of himself, he commanded me to inspect it. For a moment, in the semi-gloom of the room, I saw nothing. At length, however, the contents of the table revealed themselves, and I distinguished a motley collection of test tubes, each filled with some fluid. The tubes were attached to each other by some ingenious arrangement of thistles, and at the end of the table, where a chance blow could not brush it aside, lay a tiny phial of the resulting serum. From the appearance of the table, Daimler had evidently drawn a certain amount of gas from each of the smaller tubes, distilling them through acid into the minute phial at the end. Yet, even now, as I stared down at the fantastic paraphernalia before me, I could sense no conclusive reason for its existence. I turned to the professor with a quiet stare of bewilderment. He smiled. The experiment is over, he said. As to its conclusion, you, Dale, as a medical man, will be skeptical. And you, turning to M.S., as a scientist, you will be amazed. I, being neither physician nor scientist, am merely filled with wonder. He stepped to a long, square table-like structure in the center of the room. Standing over it, he glanced quizzically at M.S., then at me. For a period of two weeks, he went on, I have kept on the table here the body of a man who has been dead more than a month. I have tried, gentlemen, with acid combinations of my own origination, to bring that body back to life, and I have failed. But, he added quickly, noting the smile that crept across my face, that failure was in itself worth more than the average scientist's greatest achievement. You know, Dale, that heat, if a man is not truly dead, will sometimes resurrect him. In a case of epilepsy, for instance, victims have been pronounced dead only to return to life, sometimes in the grave. I say, if a man be not truly dead, but what if that man is truly dead? Does the cure alter itself in any manner? The motor of your car dies. Do you bury it? You do not. You locate the faulty part, correct it, and infuse new life. And so, gentlemen, after remedying the ruptured heart of this dead man by operation, I proceeded to bring him back to life. I used heat. Terrific heat will sometimes originate a spark of new life in something long dead. Gentlemen, on the fourth day of my tests, following a continued application of electrical and acid heat, the patient... Daimler leaned over the table and took up a cigarette. Lighting it, he dropped the match and resumed his monologue. The patient turned suddenly over and drew his arm weakly across his eyes. I rushed to his side. When I reached him, the body was once again stiff and lifeless. And it has remained so. The professor stared at us quietly, waiting for comment. I answered him as carelessly as I could, with a shrug of my shoulders. Professor, have you ever played with the dead body of a frog? I said, softly. He shook his head silently. You would find it interesting sport, I told him. Take a common dry cell battery with enough voltage to render a sharp shock. Then apply your wires to various parts of the frog's anatomy. If you are lucky and strike the right set of muscles, you will have the pleasure of seeing the dead frog leap suddenly forward. Understand, he will not regain life. You have merely released his dead muscles by shock and sent him bolting. The professor did not reply. I could feel his eyes on me, and had I turned, I should probably have found M.S. glaring at me in honest hate. These men were students of mesmerism, of spiritualism, and my commonplace contradiction was not overwelcome. You are cynical, Dale, said M.S. coldly, because you do not understand. Understand? I am a doctor, not a ghost. But M.S. had turned eagerly to the professor. Where is this body, this experiment? he demanded. Daimler shook his head. Evidently he had acknowledged failure, and did not intend to drag his dead man before our eyes, unless he could bring that man forth alive, upright, and ready to join the conversation. I've put it away, he said distantly. There is nothing more to be done. Now that our reverend doctor here insisted in making a matter-of-fact thing out of our experiment, you understand 
I had not intended to go in for wholesale resurrection, even if I had met with success. It was my belief that a dead body, like a dead piece of mechanism, can be brought to life again, provided we are intelligent enough to discover the secret. And by God, it is still my belief. That was the situation, then, when M.S. and I paced slowly back along the narrow street that contained the professor's dwelling place. My companion was strangely silent. More than once I felt his eyes upon me in an uncomfortable stare. Yet he said nothing. Nothing, that is, until I had opened the conversation with some casual remark about the lunacy of the man we had just left. "'You are wrong in mocking him, Dale,' M.S. replied bitterly. Daimler is a man of science. He is no child, experimenting with a toy. He is a grown man who has the courage to believe in his powers. One of these days, he had intended to say that some day I should respect the professor's efforts. One of these days, the interval of time was far shorter than anything so indefinite. The first event, with its succeeding series of horrors, came within the next three minutes. We had reached a more deserted section of the square a black, uninhabited street extending like a shadowed band of darkness between gaunt, high walls. I had noticed for some time that the stone structure beside us seemed to be unbroken by door or window, that it appeared to be a single gigantic building, black and forbidding. I mentioned the fact to M.S. "'The warehouse,' he said simply. "'A lonely, God-forsaken place. We shall probably see the flicker of the watchman's light in one of the upper chinks.' At his words, I glanced up. True enough, the higher part of the grim structure was punctured by narrow, barred openings. Safety vaults, probably. But the light, unless its tiny gleam was somewhere in the inner recesses of the warehouse, was dead. The great building was like an immense burial vault, a tomb, silent and lifeless. We had reached the most forbidding section of the narrow street, where a single arch lamp overhead cast a halo of ghastly yellow light over the pavement. At the very rim of the circle of illumination, where the shadows were deeper and more silent, I could make out the black moldings of a heavy iron grating. The bars of metal were designed, I believe, to seal the side entrance of the great warehouse from night marauders. It was bolted in place and secured with a set of immense chains, immovable. This much I saw as my intent gaze swept the wall before me. This huge tomb of silence held for me a particular fascination, and as I paced along beside my gloomy companion, I stared directly ahead of me into the darkness of the street. I wished to God my eyes had been closed or blinded. He was hanging on the grating, hanging there, with white, twisted hands, clutching the rigid bars of iron, straining to force them apart. His whole distorted body was forced against the barrier, like the form of a madman struggling to escape from his cage. His face... The image of it still haunts me whenever I see iron bars in the darkness of a passage. It was the face of a man who had died from utter, stark horror. It was frozen in a silent shriek of agony, staring out at me with fiendish maliciousness. Lips twisted apart, white teeth gleaming in the light, bloody eyes with a horrible glare of colorless pigment, and dead. I believe M.S. saw him at the very instant I recoiled, I felt a sudden grip on my arm, and then, as an exclamation came harshly from my companion's lips, I was pulled forward roughly. I found myself staring straight into the dead eyes of that fearful thing before me, found myself standing rigid, motionless before the corpse that hung within reach of my arm, and then, through that overwhelming sense of the horrible, came the quiet voice of my comrade, the voice of a man who looks upon death as nothing more than an opportunity for research. The fellow has been frightened to death, Dale. Frightened most horribly. Note the expression of his mouth, the evident struggle to force these bars apart and escape. Something has driven fear to his soul, killed him. I remember the words vaguely. When M.S. had finished speaking, I did not reply. Not until he stepped forward and bent over the distorted face of the thing before me did I attempt to speak. When I did, my thoughts were a jargon. "'What in God's name,' I cried, "'could have brought such horror to a strong man? "'What—' "'Loneliness, perhaps?' suggested M.S. with a smile. 
The fellow is evidently of the watchman. He is alone, in a huge, deserted pit of darkness for hours at a time. His light is merely a ghostly ray of illumination, hardly enough to do more than increase the darkness. I have heard of such cases before. He shrugged his shoulders. Even as he spoke, I sensed the evasion of his words. When I replied, he hardly met my answer, for he had suddenly stepped forward where he could look directly into those fear-twisted eyes. "'Dale,' he said at length, turning slowly to face me, "'you ask for an explanation of this horror? There is an explanation. It is written with an almost fearful clearness on the fellow's mind. Yet, if I tell you, you will return to your old skepticism, your damnable habit of disbelief.' I looked at him quietly. I had heard M. S. claim, at other times, that he could read the thoughts of a dead man by the mental image that lay on that man's brain. I had laughed at him. Evidently, in the present moment, he recalled those laughs. Nevertheless, he faced me seriously. "'I can see two things, Dale,' he said deliberately. "'One of them is a dark, narrow room, a room piled with indistinct boxes and crates, and with an open door bearing the black number 4167, and in that open doorway coming forward with slow steps, alive with arms extended and a frightful face of passion, is a decayed human form, a corpse, Dale, a man who has been dead for many days, and is now alive. M.S. turned slowly and pointed with upraised hands to the corpse on the grating. That is why, he said simply, this fellow died from horror. His words died into emptiness. For a moment I stared at him. Then, in spite of our surroundings, in spite of the late hour, the loneliness of the street, the awful thing beside us, I laughed. He turned upon me with a snarl. For the first time in my life, I saw M. S. convulsed with rage. His old, lined face had suddenly become savage with intensity. You laugh at me, Dale, he thundered. By God, you make a mockery out of a science that I have spent more than my life in studying. You call yourself a medical man, and you are not fit to carry the name. I will wager you, man, that your laughter is not backed by your courage. I fell away from him. Had I stood within reach, I'm sure he would have struck me. Struck me? And I have been nearer to M.S. for the past ten years than any man in London. And as I retreated from his temper, he reached forward to seize my arm. I could not help but feel impressed at his grim intentness. "'Look here, Dale,' he said bitterly. "'I will wager you a hundred pounds that you will not spend the remainder of this night in the warehouse above you. I will wager a hundred pounds against your own courage that you will not back your laughter by going through what this fellow has gone through, that you will not prowl through the corridors of this great structure until you have found room 4167 and remain in that room until dawn. There was no choice. I glanced at the dead man, at the face of fear and the clutching, twisted hands, and a cold dread filled me. But to refuse my friend's wager would have been to brand myself an empty coward. I had mocked him. Now, whatever the cost, I must stand ready to pay for that mockery. Room 4167, I replied quietly, in a voice which I made every effort to control lest he should discover the tremor in it. Very well. I will do it. It was nearly midnight when I found myself alone, climbing a musty, winding ramp between the first and second floors of the deserted building. Not a sound, except the sharp intake of my breath, and the dismal creak of the wooden stairs echoed through that tomb of death. There was no light, not even the usual dim glow that is left to illuminate an unused corridor. Moreover, I had brought no means of light with me, nothing but a half-empty box of safety matches, which by some unholy premonition I had forced myself to save for some future moment. The stairs were black and difficult, and I mounted them slowly, groping with both hands along the rough wall. I had left M.S. some moments before. In his usual decisive manner, he had helped me to climb the iron grating and lower myself to the sealed alleyway on the farther side. Then leaving him without a word, for I was bitter against the triumphant tone of his parting words. I proceeded into the darkness, fumbling forward until I had discovered the open door in the lower part of the warehouse. And then the ramp, winding crazily upward, upward 
upward seemingly without end. I was seeking blindly for that particular room which was to be my destination. Room 4167, with its high number, could hardly be on the lower floors. And so I had stumbled upward. It was at the entrance of the second floor corridor that I struck the first of my desultory supply of matches, and by its light discovered a placard nailed to the wall. The thing was yellow with age and hardly legible. In the drab light of the match I had difficulty in reading it, but, as far as I can remember, the notice went something like this. Warehouse Rules 1. No light shall be permitted in any room or corridor as a prevention against fire. 2. No person shall be admitted to rooms or corridors unless accompanied by an employee. 3. A watchman shall be on the premises from 7 p.m. until 6 a.m. He shall make the round of the corridors every hour during that interval, at a quarter past the hour. 4. Rooms are located by their numbers, the first figure in the room number indicating its floor location. I could read no further. The match in my fingers burned to a black thread and dropped. Then, with the burnt stump in my hand, I groped through the darkness to the bottom of the second ramp. Room 4167, then, was on the fourth floor, the topmost floor of the structure. I must confess that the knowledge did not bring any renewed burst of courage. The top floor... Three black stair pits would lie between me and the safety of escape. There would be no escape. No human being in the throes of fear could hope to discover that tortured outlet, could hope to grope his way through the Stygian gloom down a triple ramp of black stairs. And even though he succeeded in reaching the lower corridors, there was still a blind alleyway, sealed at the outer end by a high grating of iron bars. Escape! The mockery of it caused me to stop suddenly in my ascent and stand rigid, my whole body trembling violently. But outside, in the gloom of the street, M.S. was waiting, waiting with that fiendish glare of triumph that would brand me a man without courage. I could not return to face him, not though all the horrors of hell inhabited this gruesome place of mystery, and horrors must surely inhabit it, else how could one account for that fearful thing on the grating below? But I had been through horror before. I had seen a man, supposedly dead on the operating table, jerk suddenly to his feet and scream. I had seen a young girl, not long before, awake in the midst of an operation, with the knife already in her frail body. Surely, after those definite horrors, no unknown danger would send me cringing back to the man who was waiting so bitterly for me to return. Those were the thoughts pregnant in my mind as I groped slowly cautiously along the corridor of the upper floor, searching each closed door for the indistinct number 4167. The place was like the center of a huge labyrinth, a spider web of black, repelling passages, leading into some central chamber of utter silence and blackness. I went forward with dragging steps, fighting back the dread that gripped me as I went farther and farther from the outlet of escape. And then, after losing myself completely in the gloom, I threw aside all thoughts of return and pushed on with the careless, surface bravado and laughed aloud. So, at length, I reached that room of horror, secreted high in the deeper recesses of the deserted warehouse. The number, God grant I never see it again, was scrawled in black chalk on the door. 4167. I pushed the half-open barrier wide and entered. It was a small room even as M.S. had forewarned me, or as the dead mind of that thing on the grate had forewarned M.S., the glow of my outthrust match revealed a great stack of dusty boxes and crates, piled against the farther wall. Revealed, too, the black corridor beyond the entrance, and a small upright table before me. It was the table, and the stool beside it, that drew my attention, and brought a muffled exclamation from my lips. The thing had been thrust out of its usual place, pushed aside as if some frenzied shape had lunged against it. I could make out its former position by the marks on the dusty floor at my feet. Now it was nearer to the center of the room, and had been wrenched sideways from its holdings. A shudder took hold of me as I looked at it. A living person, sitting on the stool before me, staring at the door, would have wrenched the table in just this manner in his frenzy to escape from the room. The light of the match died, plunging me into a pit of gloom. I struck another and stepped closer to the table, and there, 
On the floor, I found two more things that brought fear to my soul. One of them was a heavy flash lamp, a watchman's lamp, where it had evidently been dropped, been dropped in flight. But what awful terror must have gripped the fellow to make him forsake his only means of escape through those black passages. And the second thing, a worn copy of a leather-bound book flung open on the boards below the stool. The flash lamp, thank God, had not been shattered. I switched it on, directing its white circle of light over the room. This time, in the vivid glare, the room became even more unreal. Black walls, clumsy, distorted shadows on the wall, thrown by those huge piles of wooden boxes. Shadows that were like crouching men groping toward me. And beyond, where the single door opened into a passage of Stygian darkness, that yawning entrance was thrown into hideous detail. Had any upright figure been standing there, the light would have made an unholy phosphorescent specter out of it. I summoned enough courage to cross the room and pull the door shut. There was no way of locking it. Had I been able to fasten it, I should surely have done so. But the room was evidently an unused chamber, filled with empty refuse. This was the reason, probably, why the watchman had made use of it as a retreat during the intervals between his rounds. But I had no desire to ponder over the sordidness of my surroundings. I returned to my stool in silence, and stooping, picked up the fallen book from the floor. Carefully I placed the lamp on the table, where its light would shine on the open page. Then turning the cover, I began to glance through the thing which the man before me had evidently been studying, and before I had read two lines, the explanation of the horrible thing struck me. I stared dumbly down at the little book and laughed, laughed harshly so that the sound of my mad cackle echoed in a thousand ghastly reverberations throughout the dead corridors of the building. It was a book of horror, of fantasy, a collection of weird, terrifying, supernatural tales with grotesque illustrations in funeral black and white, and the very line I turned to, the line which had probably struck terror into that unlucky devil's soul, explained M.S.'s decayed from human form, standing in the doorway with arms extended and a frightful face of passion. The description, the same description, lay before me, almost in my friend's words. Little wonder that the fellow on the grating below, after reading this orgy of horror, had suddenly gone mad with fright. Little wonder that the picture engraved on his dead mind was a picture of a corpse standing in the doorway of room 4167. I glanced at that doorway and laughed. No doubt of it. It was that awful description in M.S.'s untempered language that had made me dread my surroundings, not the loneliness and silence of the corridors about me. Now, as I stared at the room, the closed door, the shadows on the wall, I could not repress a grin. But the grin was not long in duration. A six-hour siege awaited me before I could hear the sound of human voice again. Six hours of silence and gloom. I did not relish it. Thank God the fellow before me had foresight enough to leave this book a fantasy for my amusement. I turned to the beginning of the story. A lovely beginning it was, outlining in some detail how a certain Jack Fulton, English adventurer, had suddenly found himself imprisoned by a mysterious black gang of monks, or something of the sort, in a forgotten cell at the monastery of El Toro. The cell, according to the pages before me, was located in the empty, haunted pits below the stone floors of the structure. Lovely setting. And the brave Fulton had been secured firmly to a huge metal ring in the farther wall opposite the entrance. I read the description twice. At the end of it, I could not help but lift my head to stare at my own surroundings. Except for the location of the cell, I might have been in the same setting. The same darkness, same silence, same loneliness. Peculiar similarity. And then... Fulton lay quietly without attempting to struggle in the dark. The stillness of the vaults became unbearable, terrifying, not a suggestion of sound except the scraping of unseen rats. I dropped the book with a start. From the opposite end of the room in which I sat came a half-inaudible, scuffling noise, the sound of hidden rodents scrambling through the great pile of boxes. Imagination? I am not sure. At the moment, I would have sworn that the sound was a definite one, that I had heard it distinctly. Now, as I recount this tale of horror, I'm not sure. But I am sure of this. There was no smile on my lips as I picked up the book again, with trembling fingers, and continued. The sound died into silence, 
For an eternity, the prisoner lay rigid, staring at the open door of his cell. The opening was black, deserted, like the mouth of a deep tunnel leading to hell. And then suddenly, from the gloom beyond that opening, came an almost noiseless, padded footfall. This time there was no doubt of it. The book fell from my fingers, dropped to the floor with a clatter. Yet, even through the sound of its falling, I heard that fearful sound, the shuffle of a living foot. I sat, motionless, staring with bloodless face at the door of room 4167. And as I stared, the sound came again and again. The slow tread of dragging footsteps approaching along the black corridor without. I got to my feet like an automaton, swaying heavily. Every drop of courage ebbed from my soul as I stood there, one hand clutching the table, waiting. And then, with an effort, I moved forward. My hand was outstretched to grasp the wooden handle of the door, and I did not have the courage. Like a cowed beast, I crept back to my place and slumped down on the stool, my eyes still transfixed in a mute stare of terror. I waited. For more than half an hour I waited, motionless. Not a sound stirred in the passage beyond that closed barrier. Not a suggestion of any living presence came to me. Then, leaning back against the wall, a harsh laugh. I wiped away the cold moisture that had trickled over my forehead into my eyes. It was another five minutes before I picked up the book again. You call me a fool for continuing it? A fool? I tell you, even a story of horror is more comfort than a room of grotesque shadows and silence. Even a printed page is better than grim reality. And so I read on. The story was one of suspense, madness. For the next two pages I read a cunning description of the prisoner's mental reaction. Strangely enough, it conformed precisely with my own. Fulton's head had fallen to his chest, the script read. For an endless while he did not stir, did not dare to lift his eyes. And then, after more than an hour of silent agony and suspense, the boy's head came up mechanically, came up, and suddenly jerked rigid. A horrible scream burst from his dry lips as he stared, stared like a dead man, at the black entrance to his cell. There, standing without motion in the opening, stood a shrouded figure of death, empty eyes, glaring with awful hate, bored into his own. Great arms, bony and rotten, extended toward him. Decayed flesh. I read no more. Even as I lunged to my feet with that mad book still gripped in my hand, I heard the door of my room grind open. I screamed, screamed in utter horror at the thing I saw there. Dead? Good God, I do not know. It was a corpse, a dead human body standing before me, like some propped-up thing from the grave, a face half-eaten away, terrible in its leering grin, twisted mouth with only a suggestion of lips curled back over broken teeth, hair writhing, distorted, like a mass of moving bloody coils, and its arms, ghastly white, bloodless, were extended towards me with open, clutching hands. It was alive! Alive! Even while I stood there, crouching against the wall, it stepped forward toward me. I saw a heavy shudder pass over it, and the sound of its scraping feet burned its way into my soul. And then, with its second step, the fearful thing stumbled to its knees. The white, gleaming arms, thrown into streaks of living fire by the light of my lamp, flung violently upwards, twisting towards the ceiling. I saw the grin change into an expression of agony, of torment. And then the thing crashed upon me, dead. With a great cry of fear, I stumbled to the door. I groped out of that room of horror, stumbling along the corridor. No light. I left it behind on the table to throw a circle of white light over the decayed living dead intruder who had driven me mad. My return down those winding ramps to the lower floor was a nightmare of fear. I remembered that I stumbled, that I plunged through the darkness like a man gone mad. I had no thought of caution, no thought of anything except escape. And then the lower door, and then the alley of gloom. I reached the grating, flung myself upon it, and pressed my face against the bars in a futile effort to escape. The same as the fear-tortured man who had come before me. I felt strong hands lifting me up, a dash of cool air, and then the refreshing patter of falling rain.
It was the afternoon of the following day, December 6th, when M.S. sat across the table from me in my own study. I had made a rather hesitant attempt to tell him, without dramatics and without dwelling on my own lack of courage, of the events of the previous night. "'You deserved it, Dale,' he said quietly. "'You are a medical man, nothing more, and yet you mock the beliefs of a scientist as great as Daimler. I wonder, do you still mock the professor's beliefs?' "'That he can bring a dead man to life?' I smiled, a bit doubtfully. "'I will tell you something, Dale,' said M. S. deliberately. He was leaning across the table, staring at me. The professor made only one mistake in his great experiment. He did not wait long enough for the effect of his strange acids to work. He acknowledged failure too soon and got rid of the body. He paused. When the professor stored his patient away, Dale, he said quietly, he stored it in the room 4170 at the great warehouse. If you are acquainted with the place, you will know that room 4170 is directly across the corridor from 4167. End of The Corpse on the Grating The Tell-Tell Heart by Edgar Allan Poe This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. True, nervous, very, very dreadfully nervous, I have been and am. But why will you say that I am mad? The disease has sharpened my senses, not destroyed, not dulled them. Above all was a sense of hearing acute. I heard all things in the heaven and in the earth. I heard many things in hell, but then am I mad? Hearken and observe how healthily, how calmly I can tell you the whole story. It is impossible to say how first the idea entered my brain, but once conceived it haunted me day and night. Object there was none, passion there was none. I loved the old man. He had never wronged me, he had never given me insult. For his gold I had no desire. I think it was his eye. Yes, it was this. He had the eye of a vulture, a pale blue eye with a film over it. Whenever it fell upon me, my blood ran cold. And so by degrees, very gradually, I made up my mind to take the life of the old man and thus rid myself of the eye forever. Now this is the point. You fancy me mad. Mad men know nothing. But you should have seen me. You should have seen how wisely I proceeded. With what caution, with what foresight, with what dissemination I went to work. I was never kinder to the old man than during the week before I killed him, and every night about midnight I turned the latch of his door and opened it, oh, so gently, and then when I had made an opening sufficient for my head, I put in a dark lantern, all closed, closed so that no light shone out, and then I thrust in my head, oh, you have laughed to see how cunningly I thrust it in. I moved it slowly, very, very slowly, so that I might not disturb the old man's sleep. It took me an hour to place my whole head within the opening so far that I could see him as he lay upon his bed. Ha! Would a madman have done so wise as this? And then, when my head was well in the room, I undid the lantern cautiously, oh, so cautiously, cautiously, for the hinges creaked. I undid it just so much that a single thin ray of light fell upon the vulture eye. And this I did for seven long nights, every night just at midnight, but I found the eye always closed, and so it was impossible for me to do the work, for it was not the old man who vexed me, but his evil eye. And every morning when the day broke, I went boldly into the chamber and spoke courageously to him, calling him by name in a hearty tone, and inquiring how he had passed the night. So you see, he would have been a profound old man indeed to suspect that every night, just at twelve, I looked in upon him while he slept. Upon the eighth night, I was more than usually cautious in opening the door. A watch's minute hand moved more quickly than did mine. Never before that night had I felt the extent of my own powers, of my sagacity. I could scarcely contain my feelings of triumph. To think that there I was, opening the door, little by little, and he did not even dream of my secret deeds or thoughts. I fairly chuckled at the idea, and perhaps he heard me, for he moved on the bed suddenly as if startled. Now you may think that I drew back, but no. His room was as black as pitch with the thick darkness. 
for the shutters were closed and fastened through fear of robbers and so i knew that he could not see the opening of the door and i kept pushing it on steadily steadily i had my head in and was about to open the lantern when my thumb slipped upon the tin fastening and the old man sprang up in the bed crying out who's there i kept quiet still and said nothing for a whole hour i did not move a muscle and in the meantime i did not hear him lie down he was still sitting up in the bed listening just as i have done night after night hearkening to the death watches in the wall presently i heard a slight groan and i knew it was the groan of mortal terror it was not a groan of pain or of grief oh no it was a low stifled sound that arises from the bottom of the soul when overcharged with awe i knew the sound well many a night just at midnight when all the world slept it had welled up from my own bosom deepening with its dreadful echo the terrors that distracted me i say i knew it well i knew what the old man felt and i pitied him although i chuckled at heart i knew that he had been lying awake ever since the first slight noise when he had turned in the bed his fears had been ever since growing upon him he had been trying to fancy them causeless but could not he had been saying to himself it is nothing but the wind in the chimney it is only a mouse crossing the floor or it is merely a cricket which has made a single chirp yes he had been trying to comfort himself with these suppositions but he had found all in vain all in vain because death in approaching him it stalked with his black shadow before him and enveloped the victim and it was the mournful influence of the unperceived shadow that caused him to feel although he neither saw nor heard to feel the presence of my head within the room when i had waited a long time very patiently without hearing him lie down i resolved to open a little a very very little crevice in the lantern so i opened it you cannot imagine how stealthily stealthily until at length a single dim ray like the thread of the spider shot out the crevice and fell upon the vulture eye it was open wide wide open i grew furious as i gazed upon it i saw it with perfect distinctiveness all a dull blue with a hideous veil over it that chilled the very marrow of my bones i could see nothing else of the old man's face or person for i had directed the ray as if by instinct precisely upon the damned spot and have i not told you that what you mistake for madness is but over acuteness of the senses now i say there came to my ears a low dull quick sound such as a watch makes when enveloped in cotton i knew that sound well too it was the beating of the old man's heart it increased my fury as the beating of a drum stimulates the soldier into courage but even yet i refrained and kept still i scarcely breathed i held the lantern motionless i tried how steadily i could maintain the ray upon the eye meantime the hellish tattoo of the heart increased it grew quicker and quicker and louder and louder every instant the old man's terror must have been extreme it grew louder i say louder every moment do you mark me well i have told you that i am nervous i am and now at the dead hour of night amid the dreadful silence of that old house so strange a noise as this excited me to uncontrollable terror yet for some minutes longer i refrained and stood still but the beating grew louder louder i thought the heart must burst and now a new anxiety seized me the sound would be heard by a neighbor the old man's hour had come with a loud yell i threw open the lantern and leaped into the room he shrieked once only once and in an instant i dragged him to the floor and pulled the heavy bed over him i then smiled gainly to find the deed so far done but for many minutes the heart beat on with a muffled sound this however did not vex me it would not be heard through the wall at length it ceased the old man was dead i removed the bed and examined the corpse yes he was stone stone dead i placed my hand upon the heart and held it there many minutes there was no pulsation he was stone dead his eye would trouble me no more if still you think me mad you will think so no longer when i describe the wise precautions i took for the concealment of the body the night waned and i worked hastily but in silence first of all i dismembered the corpse i cut off the head and the arms and the legs and then took up three planks from the flooring of the chamber and deposited all between the scantlings i then replaced the boards so cleverly so cunningly that no human eye not even his could have detected anything wrong 
There was nothing to wash out, no stain of any kind, no blood spot whatsoever. I had been too wary for that. A tub had caught all. <laughs> when I had made an end of these labors, it was four o'clock, still dark as midnight. As the bell sounded the hour, there came a knocking at the street door. I went down to open it with a light heart. For what had I now to fear? There entered three men who introduced themselves with perfect suavity as officers of the police. A shriek had been heard by a neighbor during the night. Suspicion of foul play had been aroused. Information had been lodged at the police office, and they, the officers, had been deputed to search the premises. I smiled. For what had I to fear? I bade the gentlemen welcome. The shriek, I said, was of my own dream. The old man I mentioned was absent in the country. I took my visitors all over the house. I bade them search. Search well. I led them at length to his chamber. I showed them his treasures, secure, undisturbed. In the enthusiasm of my confidence, I brought chairs into the room and desired them there to rest from their fatigues, while I myself, in the wild audacity of my perfect triumph, placed my own seat upon the very spot beneath which reposed the corpse of the victim. The officers were satisfied. My manner had convinced them. I was singularly at ease. They sat, and while I answered cheerily, they chatted of familiar things. But ere long, I felt myself getting pale and wished them gone. My head ached and I fancied a ringing in my ears. But still they sat, and still chatted. The ringing became more distinct. It continued, and became more distinct. I talked more freely to get rid of the feeling, but it continued, and gained definiteness, until at length I found that the noise was not within my ears. No doubt I now grew very pale, but I talked more fluently, and with a heightened voice. Yes, the sound increased, and what could I do? It was a low, dull, quick sound much such a sound as a watch makes when enveloped in cotton. I gasped for breath, and yet the officers heard it not. I talked more quickly, more vehemently, but the noise steadily increased. I arose and argued about trifles, in a high key and with violent gestations, but the noise steadily increased. Why would they not be gone? I paced the floor to and fro with heavy strides, as if excited to fury by the observations of the men, but the noise steadily increased. Oh God, what could I do? I foamed, I raved, I swore. I swung the chair upon which I had been sitting and grated it upon the boards, but the noise arose over all and continually increased. It grew louder, 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 and still the men chatted pleasantly and smiling. Was it possible they heard not? Almighty God, no, no, they heard. Suspected, they knew. They were making a mockery of my horror. This I thought, and this I think. But anything was better than this agony. Anything was more tolerable than this derision. I could bear those hypocritical smiles no longer. I felt that I must scream or die. And now again, hark, louder, louder, louder. Villains, I shrieked, dissemble no more. I admit the deed, tear up the planks. Here, here, it is the beating, the beating of his hideous heart. End of the Tell Tale Heart.